and are now in public session and I would like to thank Deputy O'Sullivan for deputising for me during the private session. Can I remind members and witnesses please to turn off their mobile phones or to switch them to flight mode because as we know mobile phones do unfortunately interfere with the sound system and they make it difficult for the parliamentary reporters to report on the meeting and also television coverage and web streaming will be adversely affected. We've reached item number six on the agenda, which is our third session on engagement with stakeholders in relation to reduced timetables. Um, two weeks ago, we had the first two of three sessions in relation to this. And um, on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome those that are our witnesses and stakeholders today. Um, Adam Harris from As I Am. Bernard Joyce, the CEO of the Irish Traveller Movement, Caroline Keane, who's the manager and solicitor uh, with Community Law and Mediation Limerick, Orla Hanahoe, who's principal of Skull Nick Wirra, Miss Mary Byrne, who's head of special ed with the NCSE. So we're going to take those witnesses first and then following that and we'll, we'll, we'll have questions then from the members of the committee and following that we will have Dr Niall Muldoon who's the Ombudsman for Children, Mr Noel Kelly who is with TUSLA, Miss Mary Craig who's the Principal Officer of Social Inclusion in the Department of Education and Skills and Eddie Ward, Principal Officer of Special Education, Department of Education and Skills and you're welcome back to Eddie. So, um, the format of the meeting is that I will invite all of you to make a brief opening statement. If I could ask you please to stay to a maximum of three minutes because we have quite a number of witnesses. We'd really appreciate that and we will have the engagement with the committee members and as I said we're going to break it into two different session sections. Before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009 witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of your evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by myself as chair to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are also reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that you should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or any official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So I would now like to call on the first witness and that's Mr Adam Harris. You're very welcome Adam. Thank you Chair and I just want to thank the committee for its courtesy in inviting me today. There was an emergency the last day I was to be here and I appreciate uh, you making it available to me. Um, reduced timetables are a daily reality for many vulnerable students and yet I think there's been a certain culture of don't ask, don't tell with devastating consequences for young people of various minority groups including autistic students and I thank the committee for looking at this issue. Issue. As I am as Ireland's national autism charity, we undertake a range of activities with the aim of bringing about an autism friendly Ireland. In recent years in the education system, there's been a number of significant adva advancements, with 86% of autistic students now attending mainstream school. This is, of course, to be welcomed. However, permission to enter a building is not, in and of itself, inclusion. It's very easy for us to pat ourselves on the back and think we're doing a great job without really scrutinising the lived experiences of many young autistic people in the education system system, particularly those who are out of school or on reduced timetables. On a day-to-day -day basis, our young people have to adapt to a way of communicating, thinking and doing which is not their own. From a young age, experiences such as getting the bus, going to a supermarket or sitting in a classroom require problem solving, <coughs> adaptation and a large degree of stress and anxiety. Uh, the principle of accessibility is something that is part of both national and international law and yet this is far from a universal reality within our education system. Many autistic students are 
asked to communicate with those who are not trained to share in that communication, are asked to sit in environments which could cause severe overload and suffering, and are asked to participate in learning and social activities which are not clear or easy to understand, and are asked to be educated alongside students and staff with often little to no knowledge or empathy of their experiences. Needless to say, for many of our young people, this is simply too big of an ask. Whilst they are doing their utmost to adapt, the system seems unable or unwilling at times to meet in the middle and provide an accessible experience. For a long time, As I Am has been contacted by parents whose children are not able to attend school. In some instances, the correct provision, be it an autism class or a special school, is unavailable, or there are not enough resources to support the child in school. In other instances, the school is not operating an inclusive practice around autism leading to anxiety, sensory overload and social isolation. And perhaps most disturbingly, most disturbingly children whose autistic behaviours are treated as matters of discipline in the same school policy designed for dealing with students who engage in activities such as smoking behind the shed. We discovered over time that the issue of children out of school was not straightforward. Often a parent could not answer yes or no to the question, does your child go to school? <coughs> They may attend but irregularly, with their levels of anxiety leading to long periods out of school. They may have insufficient support lead leading to, to school or at times a parent deciding to insist on a reduced hours timetable. Or they may simply not have a place to go to school at all. What struck us throughout the process was the apparent indifference of the department on this issue. We do not know how many autistic students are out of school, or indeed how many are on reduced timetables. They don't know because they have not asked, and as a result schools have been left to their own devices on this issue. As a result, we wanted to demonstrate that there was a genuine and real problem. We conducted a survey of the autism community in relation to absence from school and published our report, Invisible Children, during World Autism Month in April. The aim of the report was not to establish a definitive solution to the problem. This is a much bigger piece of work with no single answer, but rather to make the case for a need to look at this issue. A significant cohort of our respondents, 17%, were students who were on reduced timetables. Some of these students were as young as four or five. In some instances, parents who do not wish to have reduced timetables were threatened with suspension or expulsion processes should they not consent. In many instances, reduced timetables were a symptom of a lack of resources and knowledge. Today I'd like to make some specific recommendations which As I Am feels could assist this particular cohort of students. We're calling on the Department of Education to recognise that reduced timetables, whilst unacceptable, are happening. We do not feel a school ever has a right to place a student on a reduced timetable without a parent's consent. Equally, we strongly believe that schools should be given additional resources for students who need it most. We do understand that for some autistic students, a reduced timetable works well and is the will of the parent. As a result, we believe there should be national guidelines on the practice and the key holder to sanctioning. Um, we believe there should be national guidelines on the practice and a key holder identified who can sanction reduced hours. We believe the Board of Management should have to record all instances of reduced timetables. We feel schools need to be provided with more support and more training to better support students on the spectrum and that outside agencies such as HSE and TUSTA have an important role to play. I thank the committee for its time and look forward to your questions. <coughs> thank you, Adam. It's not the first time we've heard about New Brunswick in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and they certainly seem to have a, a really good system in place, and we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about that. Um, thank you for your contribution and for respect and time. It's appreciated. So I now move to Bernard Joyce, who's the CEO of the Irish Traveller Movement, and you're, you're welcome back to us, Bernard. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chairperson, deputies, senators, um, obviously this is our second time here in terms of the, this, before this committee. Um, as the director of the Irish Traveller Movement, um, the Irish Traveller Movement is a national traveller-based, traveller-led organisation and I welcome the opportunity to present you today on the matter of reduced timetables. Time There's an urgent, urgent need for review and, uh, review and now widespread use of reduced timetables as currently, there is no requirement in terms of monitoring the practice by the DES or TUSLA. Also, there is no support to monitor um, at a local level. Um, well, as many members may know, that um, since the cuts, 87 per cent of the cuts to travel Pacific education took place in 2011, there has been an increase from this time onwards um, in terms of the practice with the withdrawal of visiting teacher service, sorry, the withdrawal of visiting teacher service and resource teachers. Um, something like 40 t visiting teacher services were cut along with up to 500 resource teachers, um, and which plays an important role in terms of the, um, the, the reduced timetables that actually came in place. 
Another obstacle um, is to monitoring is the lack of government support uh, to national traveller organisations work in this area um, in terms of progress in traveller education. Um, the reduced timetables um, is a concern and is unacceptable practice of using in managing poor behaviour, especially for pupils at risk exclusion, including members of my community. It is critical that other approaches are considered and undertaken with mitigating issues are affecting a student's ability to engage. Other options with all parties involved, including school personnel, the pupils, Tussler, DESH, should be explored. The basics of reduced timetables should never be used to improve behavioural, special and additional needs on the basis of identity. The emergence of practice of reduced timetables for travellers in particular stems from low expectations of travellers and feeds into a narrative that our young people won't, can't accomplish their aspirations of becoming teachers, um, doctors and indeed politicians. Our young people have always had these aspirations and we need teachers to believe in their aspirations and in their dreams for the future. From a legal perspective, there is potential for legal action arising from the misuse of the practice for travellers, where any practice that might be concluded as being discriminatory in the nature, specifically under the Equal Status Act, applies. It cites four areas in which schools must not discriminate, three of which are relevant here. The access of students to a course, facilities or benefit provided by the school, any other terms or conditions of participation in school and the expulsion of a student or any other sanctions. There, ha there is alternative approaches um, used in, terms in timetables. In the UK, there is a comprehensive objective to apply stringent standards across schools on its use of reduced timetables. Time These criteria may apply for a proposal in the Irish context. Only in exceptional circumstances should there be, be occasions where, is it, where it is in the best interest of the pupil for temporary, and I say temporary, reduced part-time timetables to meet their individual needs for a time limit period. For example, where there is medical conditions, preventing the pupil from attending full-time education on a re reduced timetable is considered as part of an integration package. A reduced timetable cannot be implemented without written agreement from the parent to care and should only be used as a short-term measure. In the Irish context, this should be applied additionally. Information about your child's missing from school, from education, is essential and all schools should notify Tusla and Desh of any reduced education arrangement. And Tusla and Desh team should monitor and review these cases. An online procedure to report on arrangements should be in place in each case as it is happens in which pro proposed timelines agree between parents and the schools. And finally, in terms of recommendations, Chairperson, um, legislation to control and monitor the use of reduced timetables and adoption of mandatory protocol and guidelines for all schools, primary and post-primary. Monitor and, uh, monitor and audit current practice across all schools of reduced timetables or shortened days and refine the use of school attendance records to use as a means to shield transparency on the matter. Three, monitor complaints taken under the Act relating to practice and report on findings. Four, introduce ethnic identifiers, identifiers in proposed future regulated practice in schools and reporting and monitoring mechanism to Desh and Tussler. Five, the role of the education welfare should hold, we should hold and we would welcome additional force to a recommendation occurring where there might be greater monitoring applied in its own guidelines to schools on behaviour. It does it asks, does the school have a standardised way for staff to record matters to do with student behaviour? However, these are discretionary. And six, reinstatement of the Traveller Education Advisory Committee where the matters relate to issues affecting traveller progression in education could be brought directly to the Minister with responsibility, on responsibility and their department.
Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Bernard. And as always, practical recommendations are always very welcome. And I now move to Caroline Keane from Community Law and Mediation in Limerick. You're very welcome. Caroline. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee, for inviting us to engage in this process. And I suppose by way of background, um, to give you an idea as to how we um, became aware of this issue, Community Law Mediation is an independent, community-based law centre that works to empower individuals experiencing disadvantage through the provision of free legal advice and information, rep um, education and mediation services, primarily in um, areas experiencing social and economic disadvantage. So our engagement with the communities experiencing disadvantage in Limerick City through our free legal advice clinics, our research, our outreach programme highlighted to us the use of these um, reduced timetabling, shortened school days and in-school suspensions as being a particularly prevalent form of school exclusion. We also run a child law clinic in collaboration with the Children's Rights Alliance and we run these clinics weekly throughout the country and it has been identified through those clinics also that these um, reduced timetabling practices are um, prevalent throughout the country. As the committee will be aware, these practices, uh, practices operate outside the former school suspension system, for which there is both a mandatory recording and reporting of suspensions, and for which there is an appeal mechanism. Based on our experience, the practice disproportionately affects some of the most vulnerable groups of children in Ireland, and these include children from low, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, children with disabilities, and, travel, and children from the traveller community. Children who have been identified in successive um, government policy instruments as being at heightened risk of early school leaving. Um, the consistency of experiences shared by different organisations, including organisations and groups representing traveller and special needs children, on the prevalence of these exclusionary practices amongst these groups raises concerns for us about implications that this might have for equality legislation. Um, based on the um, incidents re reporting to us at our weekly advice clinics, both in Limerick and throughout the country, we conducted research last year in collaboration with a family resource centre in South Hill, and we had a roundtable where we invited um, representatives from a range of agencies supporting um, families in disadvantaged communities in Limerick City and County and the findings from the roundtable were consistent across the board that the prevalence of these practices are widespread. All participants at this roundtable had experience of the unofficial exclusions and they reported that it took various formats from pupils or students being sent home early from school, being put on a reduced timetabling, for example signing in the role and staying at school for two hours in a particular designated area been removed from particular classes or been sent to alternative rooms. And it was the view of the participants that the practice disproportionately affected pupils or, or students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, the traveller community and those with disability. It was also found that there was no consistency in the manner in which the practices were implemented. So it could have been um, a phone call or a text to a parent, um, but it was consistently the view that there was little or no consultation with parents, guardians or the pupils prior to the implementation of this reduced timetable. Rather, it was imposed by the school and sometimes as um, with the threat of the alternative being a formal suspension or exclusion. It was the participants' view that the parents or guardians were often uninformed about their rights um, as their student's parent or guardian in light of the impact, of the impact this had on the student's or the um, pupil's education. And I suppose the findings from our research, which was limited in its scope, are very consistent with that research conducted by Inclusion Ireland, which found only a small amount of parents, carers or guardians understood what a reduced timetable was, um, as well as the possibility of appealing it, with only 27% being able to say that the Education Welfare Officer was aware that their child had been on a reduced timetable. This was consistent with what we had um, found in our own limited research. There was also issues around the communication and the language used in terms of conveying this information to parent, um, parents, car carers and guardians um, who were almost always not informed of the rights of their child and this often res results in misunderstanding between the schools damaging relationships further. So we did ask participants to consider the impact of this practice on their child's right to education and they expressed the view that um, whilst the use of reduced school hours deprive school children of their academic skills, it often also results in the um, impact on the child's self-esteem, compassion and their ambition to succeed in life. Um, and one of the participants expressed the view that it can have long-term impacts limiting their options for the rest of their life. So just looking at some recommendations we'd like to make based on um, our own experiences. Firstly, that the committee seek legal clarity on the practice of reduced timetabling. Secondly, that the recording of shortened school days or reduced timetabling be included in the annual mandatory statutory returns school attendance data um, for schools as per section 21 of the Education Act, and that this data should be capable of disaggregation on gender, disability and socioeconomic background. 
Um, and we also recommend elaboration and dissemination of guidelines. And we looked at the Kent guidelines in the UK um, as a um, model where reduced timetabling should only be used in exceptional circumstances and where there are stringent um, parameters set out around the use and implementation of um, this practice, particularly consultation and consent from parents and impact being taken into account in terms of um, the, the length of time and the duration. Um, and finally, we recommend the implementation of legislation to clarify the practice of reduced timetabling, taking into consideration time limits, recording, reporting, um, crucially, alternative education provision during exclusions and um, greater consultation between school, parent and the appeals process. Um, thank you for this Great. opportunity. Thank you. Very interesting work. Thank you, Caroline. And now I am going to ask Orla Hanahoe, who is the Principal of School of Knockwara, to make her presentation. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Chairperson, Deputies and Senators, I welcome this opportunity to speak about my views on reduced timetables. Um, I am a primary school principal in Canuckwara Senior School, Killinard and Talla. I have been principal for 11 years in my current school and taught for 10 years in a junior school. I have a diploma in special needs education and as part of this diploma I spent time in very special schools. So I have a lot of experience on the ground which I would like to share with you. In my 11 years as principal I have put reduced timetables in place for six children and this would have been always th the last resort. And in my experience and from talking to other principals, it's always in the best interests of the child that a reduced timetable is put in place. Generally the, generally, the timetable is put in place because the child can't cope with a full day in school and requires a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention for the, child that he, for the time that he or she is in school. The child might not be succeeding in a large class and may need one-on-one -on -one or small group teaching, which can't be sustained all day because we don't have the resources. The resources that we do have is an allocation of hours for special needs teaching and this is to cover everything. It's to cover children with emotional and behavioural difficulties, learning difficulties, assessed syndromes, speech and language difficulties, ASD, physical disabilities, hearing and visual impairments and children with exceptional ability. And these hours have to be divided amongst all the children with needs in the school, including the child who needs intense support. So we have to ensure that the right to an education and to these hours for all the children is not compromised due to the needs of of one child. So it, it's a balancing act with the resources. And the following are just some examples of real situations in which reduced time tables were put in place. And I hope that this will illustrate complex issues school, that schools face. And just from listening to um, the speakers before me, we would have a process, we would record this, we would consult the parents. Like in, in my school, this is not, and the board would be involved. It's, we have very clear procedures that, uh, that we use, as with everything in the school, but again, that's only to my school. So say last year we decided to put a child on a shortened day because of the difficulties he was experiencing in the afternoons. This included violent and aggressive outbursts in which the other children and staff members were at risk. He used to run around the school, banging walls, doors, hitting children he met, upending furniture, general out-of-control behaviour. A reduced timetable was put in place in an effort to reduce suspensions as he had been suspended for these outbursts. And we wanted him to experience success in school and not end each day on a negative note. And this was temporary, it was reviewed every six weeks, mum was involved. And then we had another child then with violent and aggressive behaviour and he was also engaging in self-harm and he, he really benefited from a reduced timetable. He was on a waiting list for cams for about a year, just like he wasn't getting any other supports. When he had one-on-one -on -one attention from the teacher of the SNA, he was manageable, but when the adult stepped away, anything could happen. So there was tension and apprehension in the class due to the unpredictability of his behaviour, and this was really distressing for the other children. He eventually, we eventually got him placed in a special school for children with emotional behavioural needs, and he's doing well, like I'm still in touch with the family, and, and, and he's thriving. And now, that he's not in the classroom, the classroom's calmer because the threat of violence is gone, the children feel more secure and the SNA has more time to give to the other child. Children with SNA access in the school are in the class and the teacher feels that she's making more progress in the classroom as she spends a lot of time and energy with this child. And then a colleague of mine has had a child in a reduced timetable all year. This is a junior infant child, just to give the background. It's a child of two addicts who had been very neglected, social work was involved, so he was... <coughs> Bought into the school building, no use, never seen the school building as he had only spent time at home and he wasn't used to other adults or children. He used to come in every morning afraid, trying to escape. He was terrified. He punched, kicked and hit it 
and hit and kicked every child adult he met and this was terrifying for him and for all the other little four and five year olds in the class. So this was unsustainable. The whole school was in chaos every morning the child came in, which was terrible for him and terrible for the other kids. So with, with the foster mum and I think the social worker reduced timetables put in place and he started off one hour, hour and a half, two hours, three hours. And I believe now he's coming in until one o'clock every day. He still can't do the full day, but it's like it, it has helped him. And then a child, this is my last example, a child in sixth class in a neighbouring school, he was refusing to go to school. He had extreme anxiety about school, didn't want to be there. So an agreement with the child, the parents and the education welfare officer, because he had missed so many days in school, was that he would be, he, that if he came in, he would be allowed home early every day and this got him into school and eased his anxiety. So to conclude, we simply don't have the resources to meet the complex and extreme needs of some children. And we're balancing this with the duty of care that we have to all the children in the school. And I really think that the reduced timetables is, you know, is the small issue. I think we need to look at what's what leads to a reduced timetable. Like I would urge you to look to all the other agencies who should be supporting us and schools and the parents in managing the most vulnerable children in society and to ensure that there are alternative placements as well for children who can't cope in a mainstream school. By the time a child gets to a reduced timetable, he's been failed. Like there's layers and layers and layers, it's complex. So to conclude, I firmly believe that it's not the reduced timetable that's the issue. And again, I would agree that there has to be guidelines, nice, simple guidelines, not loads of paperwork for schools, but a checklist or whatever, something to put in, in the returns at, at the end of the year, how many children on reduced timetables. And it could be a nice, simple exercise for schools because we are flooded with paperwork at, at the moment, but something easily, I think, could be worked out. But I think that you need to look at the complex factors that contribute to a child needing one in the first place, the lack of services and supports for children in need. And also, you have to balance the needs of this one child these, with the other children in the school, because I see children in front of me, the, chi the quiet children, the children who should be succeeding and more in literacy and numeracy in everything but a lot of their time they're not getting the teacher attention time because the resources are directed to these children so i'd urge you to look at, at the big picture okay, okay thank you thank you all it's always good to hear an, uh, another perspective on it and also to look at it from the point of view of the, all of the children within a class and within the school now the final speaker in the first session is mary Byrne, who's head of special education in the ncse you're very welcome mary uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting the NCSE here today to discuss the use of reduced timetables in schools. Um, at this point, I, I, and conscious of time, I'm just going to highlight a few points from our written submission. Um, first of all, the NCSE uses the term reduced timetable to refer to school-based arrangements whereby students have a later starting time or earlier finishing time to other students, or take fewer subjects than is usual for their peers, or don't attend school for the full five days each week. In the past, we have reported concerns that for a variety of reasons, a number of students with severe EBD were not in full-time education because they were on reduced attendance as a way to assist the school to manage their challenging behaviour. We have also advised that some students with uh, autism were on a reduced timetable and are missed days from school because they could find it extremely difficult to cope in school due to extreme anxiety or sensory issues or social and communication difficulties. In some cases, these students can be marked present on the roll, but still miss significant time from school, which is not officially recorded. There was little available information about this, so the extent of the problem was not fully understood and therefore wasn't being fully addressed. We recommended that schools should be required to report these arrangements to TUSLA to ensure that these students are in receipt of an education that is appropriate to their needs and to create an understanding of the nature, extent and impact of this problem. One of our key responsibilities is to work with schools to ensure that there are sufficient places in mainstream and special schools for students with special education needs. We also provide advice and supports to schools on the education of students, as well as providing professional learning opportunities for teachers. While we don't have a direct role in ensuring that students attend school, we do support TOSLA to discharge its responsibilities to ensure that all students, including those with special education needs, attend school or otherwise receive an education. 
From time to time, information on individual students on reduced timetables is brought to our attention through, for example, re revised school transport applications or engagement with parents. While we don't track this information because we don't have a formal role in ensuring students' attendance at school, however, our CNOs, when they become aware that a student is on a reduced day or reduced timetable, they remind the school of its responsibility to report this to TUSLA, and they also support parents, schools and students where appropriate to develop a plan for the students' return to full attend attendance. We haven't as yet an informed view on whether the use of reduced timetables can be of benefit to students, as to date we don't have sufficient evidence on which to base such a view. However, we have been told by teachers and principals that there is a small but significant minority of students whose needs are so great that they are unable to manage a full school day. This could be due to school phobia or sensory difficulties or severely challenging behaviours and schools make the case that reducing the length of their school day enables these students to attend school for at least some of the day or the week. We, we consider that before reaching any decision on the appropriateness of otherwise of such arrangements, more information is required on the arrangements that schools put in place around reduced student timetables, including information on whether this includes a plan for the students' phase return to full-time education. We consider it's a really important matter, which, depending on the arrangements in place, could potentially negatively impact on the education provided to students with special education needs. The overriding imperative must be that these students receive an education appropriate to their needs. We therefore welcome this committee's examination of the issues involved, and we would be very happy to provide further assistance to the committee should this arise. And just on that note, can I just say that we have, the Council has formed extensive uh, contacts with New Brunswick over the last year, and we would be very happy to assist in any way we can in um, helping you to engage with colleagues there. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate that. Um, I'm now going to go to the members for questions and for comments, and we will go back then looking for responses to that. But also just to say to you that if there are any follow-up uh, questions that you want to answer in written form or any further documentation that you want to give to us, please feel free to do that. And if you send that back to Alan, then everybody will have the opportunity to receive that. So, Deputy Byrne. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I spoke on this issue at the last occasion, and I have to say I get angrier and angrier every time I hear this issue played out. Um, nobody has mentioned the Constitution of Ireland, where every child is entitled to a free primary education. Nobody's mentioned that. That's, we don't need guidelines from anywhere. That is the guideline, that is the law, that is the constitution of this country. And I have to say, with due respect and a huge respect for the, the, the three members from the voluntary sector, I think they need to take a harder line because I think the idea of monitoring it, guidelines and all of that, okay, it certainly needs to be monitored, I accept that. But there should be a hard line taken that every child is entitled to a free primary education. That's the hard line. I mean, Ms. Hanahoe's um, example possibly fits in with what the Department of Education the Minister has said in the Dáil, possibly an, an example of, of where that might fit in. But I am grateful to Mary Byrne, the National Council for Special, Special Education, because they are the people who advise on this, and they have not endorsed it in any way. They said they don't have the evidence to do it. That's very clear. So that's someone I'd be listening to very carefully. And I think that the issue, the, the Minister, in fairness to him, as I said last week, is very clear that this shouldn't be happening. And I presume that the, uh, that the officials are going to tell us that. The problem is, of course, that the resources within schools to make sure that schools can provide the education that's guaranteed under the Constitution uh, are provided. And that's obviously the key issue that I'll be, I'll be dealing with. But I, I honestly think that when this committee, and I, I, it all speaks for itself, uh, when this committee is, is making its report, I firmly believe that we should take a hard line on this on behalf of children. They are not entitled to be denied their right to free primary education in the Constitution by schools or by the lack of resources coming uh, from the Department. And the truth is that the only people who are on to us about this are the families of children with special needs and the representative organisations, travellers, and there's no doubt uh, people from lower so socioeconomic backgrounds, as has been said in Limerick. That's, that's the thing. This is utter discrimination. It's an excuse. Um, this, the boards of management and the ETB should be reporting this back to the Department of Education, demanding the resources be provided to ensure that children can be dealt with. Um, and I'm so grateful for the National Council for Special Education for what I believe is a hard line that they are taking on this. They are not being soft on this at all. They have no evidence. Uh, they don't believe it should be happening. 
happening. The department, the minister takes a hard line in the doll too. He says it shouldn't be happening, but I'm not sure that he's doing anything to prevent it happening. Uh, and that's, that's where this needs to come in. So that's all I have to say about this. It makes me so angry. And I think, I think we need to be uncompromising uh, on a constitutional right to education. I think I would certainly hope that that would be the case, both in terms of what, what's said and in terms of the actions then from, from the relevant government departments. Okay, thank you, Deputy Byrne. Deputy O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much to all of the presenters. Um, I agree with Deputy Byrne in relation to the constitutional right, and I think that's something that we need to put into our report, the, the clear constitutional right of children uh, to an education. Um, I think that um, a very common thread with everybody is, uh, and, and the previous people we've heard from, is that um, shorter hours or reduced timetables should not happen unless by agreement with parents, and um, the, the engagement with parents being absolutely crucial. And I think, in fairness, the examples that Orla gave us are all ones, I think, where, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I think where parents were absolutely <coughs> consulted and agreed that this was the okay. best thing for their were, particular yeah. individual children. So I think, you know, having, you know, having agreed with Deputy Byrne, I think there, are, there will be very unusual and, and occasional cases where it, it is agreed with the parents. But if that is the case, then it should also be... Um, I mean, I'm quite shocked by the statistic that Caroline uh, presented that only 27% of people were able to say that even the education welfare officer was aware of, um, of the fact that a child was on a reduced timetable. I mean, uh, the education welfare officer most certainly should be involved. Uh, and the reporting to Tusla, I think, was a recommendation from Mary. Um, and we'll be hearing, I think, from Tusla later on. But, um, so I think all of these things, I mean, you know, there may be very exceptional cases. Um, and, and I think, as I say, Orla has given us an example. I think Adam as well has suggested that there may be some cases where, uh, you know, the child to go to school at all uh, may not be able to cope with the full day. But um, absolutely, all of those, the consultation with parents is absolutely crucial. And it's something I, I, maybe I should be asking later on, but there is a parents and, and student charter uh, piece of legislation coming forward. And I think that would be one place where it certainly could, could, put, could sit. But data, data is just completely lacking from what we're hearing in terms of, of anything being required to be reported. Um, so we need the data. We need the consultation with parents. Uh, we need the rights-based approach, which uh, Deputy Byrne has proposed. Um, and uh, I suppose the other thing, I, I mean, I suppose we we're supposed to be asking questions rather than making statements, so I suppose my question would be around, um, you know, to all of you, I suppose, whether um, your, all of your experience would suggest that, um, that there is a very uneven application, first of all, that there isn't, that this is a hidden issue, uh, and I'm delighted that we have decided to explore it here in the committee and we need to make strong recommendations. But, um, you know, whether you feel that, you know, that that is the way in which it should be approached, that it, it needs to be an absolute um, right of the parents to be consulted, um, that it, it needs to be, data needs to be returned, uh, and we need to ensure that it is not used by any school, and I, I, from Orla's description, obviously, it's not used in her school, but certainly from what we've heard previously and what we're hearing today, uh, it is used by some schools in a way that um, is not appropriate uh, and is most certainly not in consultation with parents and does appear to um, unduly affect children from certain categories, uh, whether that be lower socio-income uh, categories, travellers, uh, or children with disabilities of one kind or another. So, um, you know, I think this is very important work that we're doing. Um, a lot of what we do here is, is material that people are already aware of. This is something I think that genuinely is not in the public arena as it should be. Um, so, again, you know, any response you'd have just specifically in, in, in the areas I've raised would be welcome. Thank okay. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Martin. Thanks very much. And like my colleagues here, um, as we said uh, two weeks ago, we're just, it's, it's appalling um, what is happening. Um, the operation of the reduced timetables, it's a huge disservice to our most vulnerable children. Um, but also there is the, the lack of support for our principals and teachers in some very difficult um, situations where they feel they're being forced in, into operating this as well. Um, and. Just, I, I just don't know how this has been allowed to continue and that minister after minister and, and the department um, have just thrown a blind eye to this. Um, and I guess to, to all of you, I'm just wondering, like, what do we know about how are the teachers selected to be with the student? Like, 
what qualifications does the teacher have to, to be that one-on-one -on -one person? Are there times where it's not a teacher, where it's an SNA? Um, when the SNA was hired in the school, were they informed there will be occasions where you'll be the one person with the most difficult student in, in, the, in the school? And um, that's part of your job, because I don't believe that's part of an SNA's job whatsoever. There's to, to support a child's education with the teacher in, in the classroom. So the, the SNA and the student there are suffering that scenario, if that's happening. Um, what do, do we know any information of, of the rooms being used um, in this reduced timetable and how suitable they are? I'm just curious about that. Did that come up in the survey? Um, do, do we have any idea, um, obviously the department hasn't, but do we have any idea um, that the, the maximum amount of weeks that, that this is happening? Like, I know already you mentioned six weeks, then it's reviewed. Um, but has it ever gone on for like half a year where a child is on a reduced timetable? Has it gone on longer? Um, <coughs> are parents all as informed um, of that option for the Section 29? What happens when the parents don't, don't agree? There's, there's a multitude of, of questions here. Um, Orla, when I was listening to you, the, or, you know, it was really screamed at as we simply don't have the resources. You know, yeah. that's appalling because, I say, as I say, it's a disservice to you as a principal trying to run your school and it's a huge disservice to, to the students, to all students, those with difficulties, those there with no difficulties just coming in and just want to, to learn. Um, and what do you need? Um, has the, are you aware of anything at all that the department is doing to, to help you? Because there is, you know, in just the cases you've outlined, that's huge behavioural difficulties. Yeah. You see... Sorry, as so, um, we go back to um, yeah. And I suppose, or how do you choose um, the teacher that, that, that teaches in the, and you did say in one case, teacher or SNA, or when the adult isn't there, and is it, is it a case that sometimes it is only uh, an, S, an SNA and not, not um, a, a teacher? Um, and have you ever received any communication whatsoever from the department in relation to the, the operation of, of reduced timetables or during an inspection has it ever arisen? So just thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Deputy Martin. Senator Byrne. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks very much for your presentations. And um, I know I'm involved in a school myself, so I went and I visited two or three schools, and I know it's something that's really of concern to me, you know, where, where it's been used properly in some schools as, as portrayed by Orla, I suppose, in her presentation, and in one or two other schools. And then I think that there are schools, and I suppose that's the area that's of concern to all of us, where it is being abused or, or being used as an excuse. So I suppose, have you any suggestions, and I'm just putting this, as to, I, I know currently that the school is, or that they're supposed to comply and speak to the parents. They're also supposed to report it to TUSLA, and, and there is a complaints process if the parents feel that um, that it's not being complied with properly, that they can complain to an inspectorate. But I suppose to the panel, have you any suggestions, um, further suggestions that would strengthen the case of, um, you know, especially when in areas where parents think that their children are not receiving a fair um, hearing, or maybe hearing isn't the right word, but you know that that, that you know that, that it's been used as an excuse. So have you any idea, any ideas or suggestions as to how? Um, it can be strengthened to, to support those families. So, thank you. thank you, Senator. Senator Gavin. Thank you, Chair. I want to thank all of the uh, uh, presentations. Uh, powerful and, and, and quite shocking. It must be so frustrating because everyone here agrees that this shouldn't be happening. I think everyone here will agree in terms of the resources as well. Uh, and particularly powerful um, presentation from, from yourself in terms of the, 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 the challenges that teachers face in particular. Uh, and as Deputy Byrne has pointed out, the Minister will agree as well, and yet it seems to be continuing to happen. Uh, it, it's a failure, collective failure of politics. Um, I want to apologise because I'm due in the other chamber in a few minutes. I will have to leave, but I will follow on in, in terms of this, the scripts today. I just want to ask one question of, of Mary, um, and, and it's meant respectfully because you, you do tremendous work, but you recommend your organisation re reducing capitation grants in schools with children on reduced timetables, and I would just have a concern around that in terms of the potential unintended consequences because I, I get why that could be an argument that's made but surely the issue is schools that are facing challenges need more resources 
Uh, and again, that comes back to the monitoring in particular. Again, I just want to thank you all for your presentations. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Callagher. I'm a guest here today, um, uh, taking up the place of. Um, thank you very much. Um, hopefully, less controversial than my last uh, visit, uh, <laughs> Chair. Uh, I promise to behave myself today. Uh, um, I want to really commend the committee for for surfacing and examining this issue, which I think is one of those things that has been hidden in plain sight. And I think this is a really, really um, important. Uh, examination and the testimonies from 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 people experiencing disadvantaged travellers, uh, children with autism. Uh, I think you know the impact of the reduced timetables, and obviously there are there are good ways of using this, but there is also hugely sort of um, uh, challenging ways. And I and I absolutely agree with Deputy Byrne. All children, all children, have a right to education. And we must keep that front and centre. And I, I would, you know, again, as a guest, would hope that the committee bears that in mind. Um, and so it's not an if, it's a how. And I think that's what the committee really, you know, uh, it would be important to examine. And I suppose my first job uh, is very wet behind the ears. A uh, community worker in Finglas was a youth encounter project, which was all about uh, children who were at risk uh, of, of getting into all sorts of trouble and I was a community worker there and you know it was a really at St Paul's is still going strong and it does incredible work so obviously there is examples like New Brunswick but we have very good examples as well you know on our doorstep of how we can uh, link up and connect with children who might otherwise be at risk and uh, the Ombudsman for Children and I attended an event uh, about Oberstown and it was very stark more than half of the children the young people there were people who were out of school for one reason or another, whether it was on reduced timetables or excluded. So the costs in terms of their lives, but also society, are huge when we don't pick this issue up. So my question, I suppose, um, Mary, uh, uh, from, from the National Council for Special Education, and uh, Deputy Byrne and I worked hard on giving you additional powers with regards to autism classes and the education admissions to schools. Do you need uh, as a council, more powers to tackle this issue, and do you need more resources? And please let us know because we are legislators. Yes, we have, and we'd be willing to give you more if you need them, um, because I think there is a consensus that we don't. This practice is something that should be exceptional, um, and, uh, and and going back to every child having an education. Uh, to Orla from Killinarden, and I'm sure as my colleague Lane had some uh, sort of uh, connection in you being here today, um, I, I'd be interested in, you know, in an ideal world, what resources would you need if you could have anything? What, what was the scale of resources that you'd need to make sure that all the children on your role, for all their circumstances, and you gave us very strong examples, what would the extent of resources that you would need to give that education to children? And the data deficit, where does that belong? Is that the Department of Education? Is it with the schools? Is it with TUSLA? Um, I would like to hear that. And also, the prevalence of this practice, and also, is it getting worse or is it getting better? And also, the kind of clear data about uh, to whom it particularly applies. So, uh, I would like to hear from you on, on those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. I have a few short questions that I will add before we go back to the witnesses, and I'll be specific about who I'm addressing them to as well. Um, Adam, you were talking about the provision of additional therapies, um, and I'm just wondering, are you suggesting that that happens during the school day? Should that be timetabled uh, during school time for the, uh, for the students? And also you were talking about um, boards of management should explore other options before recommending that an autistic student with overly complex needs be expelled or transferred to another school. Uh, within the context of schools having limited resources, um, I'm just wondering about the impact on the other children in the class, considering that a third of the respondents in your own survey said that their child was on reduced timetable due to a lack of resources. So the whole area of resources is, is a really big one there. Um, Bernard, you were, talk, you were talking about um, the reduced timetables being employed for behaviour management situations. Just wondering if you have any alternative strategies that you would recommend or suggest should be 
taking on board uh, with that. Uh, Caroline, um, you were talking about data that, that could be used, and I'm just wondering the, how you propose data on the use of the reduced timetables um, in relation to gender, disability, socioeconomic background, how that should be disaggregated, because sometimes when we label too much or when we have too many boxes to tick, again, that, that can lead to further segregation and possibly more exclusion. Um, I was also just wondering, was there any particular reason that the Department of Education and Skills or any other state body, such as the NCSE, did not take part in the roundtable discussion? Maybe they weren't invited, but I'd just be interested in knowing the reason on that. Um, Orla, it's always good you know, to listen to, to another perspective and coming from a teaching background, I, I would have evidenced what you're talking about. I, I don't, I, I would be along the lines with my colleague, Deputy Byrne, in terms of um, ensuring that every child has the opportunity to have a school education. But that's not taking away at all from understanding the situation that teachers and other pupils have to deal with and that, how, how that impacts. Um, but you talk about resources that, that are needed in terms of helping parents manage their children um, because sometimes parents have their own complex needs. So I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that uh, because obviously sometimes we need to help with parenting skills as well and sometimes through schools we can do that. Um, Mary, uh, I share Senator Gavin's view in relation to the possible reduction of capitation grants because I think that uh, certainly can disadvantage children in an already stretched environment and that's not something that I would like to see happening. But I also want to ask you about the role of parents in a reduced timetable situation. Um, in your experience, do parents fully engage in terms of arriving at a mutually acceptable situation? Obviously, we want parents to be consulted at all times, but uh, is there a, a full engagement there? I've dealt with both parents and teachers in relation to this situation, so I'm just interested in your perspective on that. So I'm going to go back now uh, to the panellists. So we might do it in reverse order. And Mary, maybe I'll ask you to respond first. Thank you. Um, in relation to the questions that were posed, I just have a couple of comments I'd like to make back. One of the questions, or, or a number of the questions, revolved around what supports um, schools have or what support schools need. And I'd like just to draw the committee's attention to the fact that the department and, and the government, in fact, have improved, have approved um, a new pilot of a school inclusion model from next September in one area. Um, this is based on recommendations that the NCSE has made in the past that uh, students and, and those with behavioural difficulties and communication and sensory difficulties and so on require the appropriate support at the right time. And uh, in order to uh, put some of those appropriate supports in place, we will have in that pilot area a range of supports. So, for example, the NCSE will have speech and language therapists and some behaviour practitioners and OTs. And we really will be trying to work with NEPS and with the HSC and with other services in the area to try and see what model of support can be put in place in schools to assist schools and to build their capacity to try and work with students with the most challenging of needs. So it will be, and this project will be evaluated and it will be very interesting to see what the outcomes for students are and if in fact it does uh, have outcomes that might be, end up with you know, fewer students need to be put on reduced time period. So I think that's a really important um, project and one that has relevance to this area. Um, the second th point I suppose I'd like to make is that it's not just in Ireland we're hearing about an increase in children being on reduced timetables. Um, this is a phenomenon that's happening in a number of different countries. And, you know, to the point where I think it's important to stand back as well, not just to look at, at the reduced timetable bit, and I think that Orla referred to this, I think we need, it would be really good to look at what's driving this increase and what are the reasons behind this. And given that we now know that this is an international phenomenon, perhaps Ireland could play a part in uh, setting up some kind of a re research project 
an international research project where we look at this. We were thinking perhaps funding might go to the education research unit or, you know, or an agency like that to um, engage in that type because we absolutely are not on our own in this. Um, the third point I wanted to make was uh, in relation to schools do have a responsibility to ensure that uh, those teachers with the greatest level of experience and qualifications are working with students with the greatest level of need. And whilst many um, schools undoubtedly try to do that, um, we are sometimes disappointed to hear of situations where this isn't the case in how, in particular, teachers are deployed uh, to special classes. And we are told sometimes that, you know, principals can find it hard to, find their, to get their experienced teachers to take these classes, sometimes because they're not confident enough or they feel they don't have the requisite skills. But, but really, this may, isn't a reason to not give the class the most experienced and most um, qualified teachers. Finally, I was asked um, two specific, uh, no, three specific things that I'd like to address. Um, we were... Uh, Senator Kelleher very kindly suggested that we might need more powers or more resources to tackle this um, issue. Actually, the NCSE, we consider that we're only part of this picture. This is much wider than students with special education needs. And whilst we have given consideration to whether our seniors should be collecting um, this data or not, we actually feel that we could get an accurate picture because we'll only get information on students with special needs. It wouldn't be right that we will get students, uh, information on other students. So we feel we need a comprehensive approach to data collection um, and that schools should be enabled to report on this centrally so that we get um, a composite and a comprehensive picture across uh, schools and across students. The, the question of our recommendation on the capitation grant and the reduction in the capitation grant has come up from two or three of you. And just in relation to that, yes, we did suggest that the department might consider in schools. And what we had in mind there was that, of course, schools need to be supported. But perhaps the department also need to consider a disincentive for schools who might be overly engaging in the practice of reduced timetables. It was in that context we made that recommendation. Um, you asked me then about the role of parents and, you know, are they engaged and is this a mutually acceptable agreement? And I, and I have to honestly say that I don't know the answer to that because we don't. We don't know. We don't have the data, so I, I can't respond to that. So, um, and, and the very last point was, um, to my knowledge, NCSE didn't receive an, an invitation to engage in a roundtable discussion. We generally would engage if we're invited. Okay. Thank, thank you for that, Mira. Go back to Orla. Um, okay. I was asked quite a few questions, so I'm trying to re recall them all here. But, Basically, it, it would be down to resources. Like, first of all, the school I work in, to give you context, like we're one of the most marginalised communities in the country. It's a tough, tough place. It's like we're facing really complex issues every day. Like, number one, I would think would be class size. At the moment, I'm a senior school. It's 24 to one is the pupil-teacher ratio in the school down the road in more middle class because in every other school it's 26 to 1. Like that's not really much of an ad advantage. I think that there should be a smaller um, class size and something that I'm working on with a group of DESH principals to have a maximum class size in junior schools in the, in the most disadvantaged schools of 15 to 1 and a maximum of 20 to 1 in our school. I would feel that if we had smaller classes we would have better, you know, more time for relationships because a lot of this stems down to relationships and the connection that the child can have with the teacher. And there's a lot of children in the class with complex needs. So I would say we would definitely need a smaller class size. And then with staffing, staffing is a huge issue at the moment. There is a crisis in teaching. For this year, I've had one post that I've been unable to fill. I've had about five different teachers in this post all year because um, we can't get to teachers. Like this, I'm sure it's been reported by the INTO and whatever, but I've been using um, student teachers and I might get a teacher for a month here or a month there and having to split classes. Like staffing is a huge issue. So when I'm looking now to, you were asking there, how do I decide what teacher goes with what class, Catherine? I would look, you know, now I'm lucky we are 
a small enough school. I have 170 kids, so I know the kids, I know the teachers, and it's matching personalities who will work with who, and the most experienced teacher goes with the most, you know, challenging children, the most challenging classes. But um, we're struggling to get staffing. Like, I have, say, two temporary posts now and two permanent posts, and my ad is up a week. I've only had 10 applicants for the two temporary posts, and I have two permanent posts that I've advertised, and I'm on my last day of advertising, and nobody wants it. Teachers aren't choosing to work in schools like mine as well, which is a challenge. Like, and I want the best teachers mm -hmm for my children, like, and that's what I, I would say to them, like, you know, it's, and once you get a teacher in a desh school, and they get, like, they're afraid, but once they're in, they, they generally love it, and they stay, because you get such satisfaction from dealing with children, you know, in, in our areas, and from, you know, seeing them progress, so that is, like, that's, and I know the department's probably aware of it, but there is a teacher crisis at the moment, we can't, there's not, there's not a great choice at the moment, so, you know that that's an issue and the class size and then again it's the waiting lists for cams and for speech and language and like i know statistically like a lot of children who have difficulties with speech and uh, behavioral difficulties can stem speech and language difficulties there's a waiting list i think of about eight months and then if the parent does engage um like they might get a block of therapy and then they have to wait for another six months like there's huge waiting lists for ot because the ot with our children with asd when we do get um, when we do get to work with the occupational therapists. We realise like what helps a child. Like for example, we've one child who loves pressure, and we have him. He wears his coat half the day, and he likes to carry piles of books around. And you know, we, we find out what works for him. But we we need a multidisciplinary approach, as what Mary said. Like I would love to see in an ideal world, I'd love to have access like a hub of like say a psychologist an ot speech and language therapist clinical psychologist like working to serve say disadvantaged schools in particular to serve in the schools because there's the capacity of the parents as well they don't have the capacity the capacity sometimes to attend the appointments so we would have missed appointments i would use my home school liaison officer with say a lot of these children who i spoke so she would have picked up mom and driven mom to the appointment and waited for her and held her hand you know to get to the, the therapy you know that's a huge process in itself and then we also, what we do find beneficial in our school is we have access to a counsellor. We get a counselling grant from Tusla and we have a counsellor who comes to our school two days a week. And that has helped a lot of our children with, say, emotional and behavioural difficulties because they have somebody to talk things through and to help them with the bereavements and the tragedies that they're facing. Um, then... Um, yeah, well, it's, um, and to me, it's all about early intervention because really by the time a child gets to secondary school, and um, I think it's very, very hard to pull them back. And I would know from the secondary school in our area what they're facing with. Like, at this moment, like, there is open drug dealing during during the day there's children going into that secondary school on drugs I would have come across children you know in sixth class who would be taking drugs as well so like it's it's a massive social issue in our particular area which you know it's not a simple process and um something what did I want to say yeah and we wouldn't we'd never have an SNA working with a child alone um it's generally a team like there's children who we would have to have two adults with at all at all times, like if they've, they're very difficult, and they would be in and out of the classroom with the SNA. The SNA could, might see that they're getting a little bit fidgety, a little bit difficult, and just bring the child out, do a job, or go to another room. But it would be in the classroom. We've no special rooms or whatever, you know. And if we ever do something that we do as well to avoid suspending children, is an in class suspension, in school suspension, where they would spend time out of their own class but down with another teacher. And that sometimes helps them because they want to get back to their own class. And it's keeping them in school and with, you know, and learning and engaged, but it makes them want to be with their peers. So that's a strategy we found that's actually been very beneficial. Um, yeah, is, is there anything that anybody wants to ask me? Because I, 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 I just feel that it's that our school would be struggling at the moment there's so many issues to face it's the complex issues of our particular area so i would feel that you, you have desh band one schools but then you have we would call them desh plus and that they need even more resources than the more 
you know, privileged schools or middle class schools need as well. So I think that that needs to be taken in account because I'd say if you were to do a survey of where the reduced, you know, as I'm sure you found, like it is in the very um, ex disadvantaged communities. So they need to be targeted first. They need to get more um, resources than the rest of the schools. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So oh, that's, that yeah. So yeah, yeah. We'd, we would have that, that experience as well. Yeah. Thank you. There will be an opportunity for a yeah. supplementary uh, when everybody is finished, if there's needed, you know. But thank, thank you for that. It's yeah. harrowing what you're describing, but it's real, realistic. It's, it's a true yeah. picture, and, and that's so, what we and need to hear. And that's yeah. what happens when it's, you know, we've so much to think about, and when yeah. to reduce timetable. It is, and you're trying to engage <coughs> with parents who don't really have the capacity, like you're trying to help them and to get them to appointments and but like these you know I would have huge empathy for the parents who mm. have like a 10 or 11 year old boys who might be hitting them at home and they're yeah. trying to manage yeah. them or they're trying to manage their sensory needs and they've no education themselves so I think the parents need more support mm. as well. Absolutely thank you thank you Orla. Um, Caroline I'm going to turn to you now. Um, I suppose looking at one of the first issues that was raised um, um, and Deputy Sullivan questioned the issue as to the engagement of consultation with the parents. Um, I suppose I can only speak from my own experiences. We run two clinics a week in Limerick, and these would be in areas which have very high early school leaving, um, as high as 46% in one area in terms of early school leaving, which is far higher than the, the national average, 12.5%. Um, so you're dealing with parents who would, might have a very poor educational history themselves in terms of their own experience with schools. Um, and oftentimes in an issue that, that Orla mentioned is the capacity of the parent to engage with the school can also equally be an issue at times. Um, so for the most part, the parents that will come and that I will meet weekly at clinics. Yesterday I met a parent who tells me her son has been on um, reduced timetabling for four months and she does not know the reason why. Now, you know, she doesn't, there's no formal communication around this. It's a practice that has kind of slid into um, existence, but she does not know the reason why. There's no piece of paper, there's no form, there's no letter, there's no way to appeal this. Um, and sometimes the, the balance of power is such that she knows that if she does something to challenge this or appeal this, the alternative might be a formal suspension or a formal exclusion. So it's almost better than nothing. Um, and it's almost that the parent is accepting that this is better than nothing. And as, as Deputy Byrne says, when, when a child has the right to an education, better than nothing is not enough. Um, you know, the child has the right to five hours 40 at primary school level or, or six hours at, at secondary school level. And, um, you know, if they're not getting the capacity to, to, to be, to have that, um, um, that, that education, well then better than nothing is not enough. But I think a piece of work has to be done around particular in, in particular areas where, as Orla has identified, there's um, capacity issues with parents. Um, and I know there's some pilots running in Limerick in Corpus Christi School in Myros that um, Deputy O'Sullivan and, and Senator Byrne might be aware of, and the Lakela School in Roxburgh, where, for example, they're, they're working to have all those services within the same footprint. So you will have the child entering in to the um, um, early school years and then into primary school level and the speech and language therapist will be on site and the physiotherapist will be on site and all the services that the family will need to support that child including supports for the family will be on the one side so that it reduces this um, because the, the instances of do not attend or did not attend for some of these services were so staggeringly high that they thought they'd bring them to the schools so they're building that footprint in Limerick and the Lakeela model at the moment and I also know that in the Corpus Christi school in Myros they are doing an awful lot of work um, to support um, parents in terms of parenting capacity because they recognise that you know it's not enough to address the issue at the child's level you know the parent this is generational you know this is generational you see generation of upon generation in particular areas where early school leaving um, is, 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 is part of the fabric of the, of the family of the area in which they live so I suppose that engagement piece is huge in terms of the parents capacity um, to support their child and um, that's a huge issue. Um, De Deputy Martin raised the issue as the length of time and is there any, any measurement in that? Last week I had a family come to me whose child entered into secondary school, is just about to complete second year now, but has been on a reduced timetable since their second month of first year. So we're looking at two years. Um, and um, he's now 
um, you know, go, going into his junior search year, having been on a reduced time till for two years, and not any one particular issue, lots of a culmination of lots of different issues. And again, the parent here is almost, it's a better than nothing approach. Um, and this child doesn't have any particular identified need, but would have disciplinary issues. But then when you drill down to it, this, you know, the, the home tutoring was suggested as a possible solution to this family. There is two adults and seven children in a two bedroom house. You know, how does home tutoring work in that scenario? I mean, where's the capacity to actually facilitate that? Um, and no doubt that's part of the problem that this child is bringing to school with them when there's so much overcrowding, that they're bringing this to school with them. Um, you know, so I suppose it's, there's different layers as to, um, mm. as to why this practice happens. And, you know, I, I think to, to, to look exclusively at it on, on the basis of, um, you know, a child with a disability or a child from a traveller community um, or a child from a particular disadvantaged background. There's so many different layers. You know, you have children coming to school from hotels now and not having the capacity to go home and do their homework or to get a good night's sleep. Um, you know, homelessness is a huge issue we deal with um, in our law centre in Limerick and Dublin, and it has massive impact on um, the child's ability to actually do a, school, a full school day. So, you know, there's so much, and this is why, um, and the question that you had raised, Chairperson, in terms of the, the, the I suppose, the, the, the data that's collected, like, that's a very critical issue because, you know, there, there could be other alternative educational provisions that could be identified if you know the basis upon why this child is in a reduced timetable. Because as I said, you know, issues such as disability or a particular um, economic um, or social background might be very evident. But something like hidden homelessness or something, you know, is, is kind of goes under the radar. Um, and per perhaps that child needs that support because of their particular circumstances <coughs> for that time. Um, so that's, I suppose, in terms of answering your own question and the data as to how it could be used. In terms of our own roundtable in Limerick, I suppose it was um, organised um, locally and it was um, we sent our invitations through the Limerick Citywide Children and Youth Forum, which is made up of services supporting um, families with, um, across the city and the county. Um, and I don't believe that the, you'd ask if the department are a member of that a body. I suppose our, our, our hope would be that we'd be able to extend it further. But it was just a, a small net piece we did last year. We've limited resources, unfortunately. Um, so I think that that is it. Um, in terms of the questions that were posed, unless there's anything further. No, that's fine. Thanks, Thank Caroline. You. Thank you. Uh, Bernard. OK, maybe just to give some feedback in terms of some, some of the comments. Um, um, Deputy Byrne, um, just um, your comment is around um, education being a constitutional right. Um, we certainly welcome that, and that has been stated probably here, but we've been stating that for quite a long time, that it is a fundamental right in terms of full-time education. And I think to deprive anybody of that is certainly, you know, it's wrong. Um, and, um, and I suppose that's why we're here in terms of today, because um, in terms of outcomes for travel children and for children with autism um, and for others in terms of socioeconomic, um, it, it, it impacts um, in such a way that um, people don't end up, um, you know, um, completing their education or they leave school without um, the, their leaving cert um, or even their junior cert for that, that, that fact. Um, so it, just around the, um, the, the, the other issues um, that we've been contacted um, across the country by parents um, who have told us that their children are on a reduced timetable. They've informed us that they don't necessarily know, and they don't know in terms of what type of recourse they can take. So they don't know in terms of the procedures or what legislation is currently in place. Um, and, uh, and while we know there is remedies, um, it, it is being left to the parent to address that particular issue. And we, and we feel that that's certainly not the right approach to take. Um, in addition, that I'm just looking at a submission that we put in um, from Dairy Travel Movement. Um, and while it's, while it's a, a submission, quite a significant letter of times from April, 2007, to April 2011, it was regarding the education cuts. Um, and we've always con we've contested that there is a connection between the cuts and the reduced timetables that are directly impacting on travel children today. Um, and we've heard it in terms of, you know, what you were saying around the resources. But when you remove 
the very infrastructure of resources that was put in place to support, to enable, to strive and encourage um, parents, schools and put those resources and you, you removed them overnight, then it's going to have a you know, significant impact. And I think that we're seeing that today. So we've lost a generation of young travellers in terms of, in terms of primary, post-primary, and has been a regressive step. So one of the recommendations um, has been that there should have been an audit in terms of why those cuts took place, um, to fully assess whether the cuts themselves were justified or disproportionately carried out. Um, and from my understanding, that, was, that, was, that didn't materialise. Um, we lost 40 visiting teachers, which was, would have linked in with the community and with the schools. And again, that would have been very helpful in terms of, you know, in terms of today. Um, to resource teachers in schools, um, there was, um, my, I can give it a, a, an estimate, but there was 500 at that time. Um, and again, they were gone. Um, and I think when you do that to the most, most vulnerable, marginalised, socially excluded group, um, you know, it's fundamentally wrong. It's, you know, it, 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 it's wrong in every sense, and I think that um, where, um, young travellers today, um, their opportunities are now are being limited. So we need to address that in terms of those resources, so I think, for schools. So it's not about blaming the schools. It's about looking at how we work with the system that's, you know, by, that, that has cut those resources and to work to improve them. But it's also to ensure that where there's, um, where there's reduced, reduced timetables, that, um, you know, that, that has to, there has to be a very clear rationale um, in terms of why that's in place, but also in terms of looking at what resources then can be put in place to ensure that every single child has access to full education um, within the system. Um, and we're just not, we're, uh, we're not hearing that as a current stand. So if people are going to, to, you know, in terms of the community law centres, in terms of seeking advice or supports, whether they're going to NGOs, um, and that seems to be a recourse where, where people are starting to bring their, those issues. Um, so we've made some clear, obviously, recommendations, mm -hmm. but I think there is, there is um, but, but there has to be a kind of a framing and ensuring that um, with immediate effect that, you know, this is eradicated. Like, I, don't, I do not accept for one minute that a child should be put on a reduced timetable out of further, you know, and, 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 and I am concerned that it could be based on, you know, um, you know identity as, as one of those. Because um, we just don't, you know, and I think that's what we're hearing. It's, it's, it's based on identity and expectation as opposed to anything else. And they do accept there's reasons and rationales. But even in terms of some of the schools that, um, and I know you mentioned that, that there was a, tra a traveller child. Um, like, you know, it's just disproportionate. Um, so we do need to get to, you know, to examine and, a very, and, and not wait for international best practice. Ireland has to step up and needs to, in, you know, step up um, and put in best practice in Ireland in order to shape that in terms of Europe. So I wouldn't be waiting for international um, best practice. I think we need, to, we need to develop the best practice. And, and the departments need to be collaborating and working together to ensure there's a you know, st strategic, coordinated approach that's taking place. Now do we know it's there? The question now is, you know, everybody and all the political parties as well collaborating and working together ensuring that this is stopped. Okay. Thank you very much. Adam. Uh, just to go first to your questions, uh, Chair, just in relation to my point around the Board of Management, I think one of the concerns that As I Am has had for some time has been that Boards of Management are often asked to make very significant decisions around opening autism classes, around suspensions, expulsions, and the role of a Board of Management, of course, is to oversee a principal and hold the principal to account from a governance point of view. But we're very concerned on very, very few Boards of Management. Is there any representative of a parent of a child who has special mm -hmm. needs, or indeed a person 
person who has that expertise and we think that's quite worrying and perhaps it's something that the patron body should look at but I think it's quite um, important because I do feel whatever comes out of this process in terms of reduced timetables it has to be more than simply a recording exercise by a principal it has to actually involve a degree of sanction a degree of approval um, just in relation to the impact on other children um, there's no doubt from our perspective that it's really important that schools that are being inclusive that are enrolling students uh, with disabilities and other and other needs um, are appropriately resourced but what I do just want to point out is that the evidence shows that in the vast majority of cases having a child with a disability in your class has a very very positive impact on other children uh, educationally and indeed we saw this ourselves in a survey we conducted in April where a thousand people at random in, the, in society we, we polled their attitudes to autism and the most open on every single question we asked was the 18 to 25 cohort. And the reason for that is they've sat in classrooms with people who have disabilities. And I think that's what's really important. Just in relation to the therapies piece that you asked me about, um, I, it, it was in reference to the piece that Mary has already spoken about in terms of the in-school therapy pilot and also the proposals around the reform of the SNA scheme. I do think, you know, picking up on what Orla said earlier about how there is bigger issues overriding all of this, I think one of the challenges is while mainstreaming has been so important, what we have maybe done is lost some expertise in the process. So, you know, when a child used to attend a special school and can access a lot of people who had advanced knowledge, therapeutic backgrounds, etc. And now mainstream schools presently don't have that resource. So I think that's something that's really important. Um, Deputy Byrne referenced the constitution and I think that's something that we would very much agree with and make the point frequently. Also the broader illegality of the issue even in terms of pieces like the Education Act. But I think there's another area of the Constitution this relates to and that is the parent as the primary educator. Because, you know, the parents of children in our community play a really central role in advocating and supporting for their children. But our experience is they have the least choice and the least input around their child's education compared to other children. Because in our data, a lot of the young people who are on reduced timetables, one of the key reasons their parents are citing this is, I wanted my child to go to an autism class, I wanted my child to go to a special school, and that wasn't possible. The question was asked, was there a scenario where, was it usually a good engagement between parent and school? And unfortunately, we have found a lot of instances where the engagement has been quite appalling. And I would use the term manipulative to describe how parents have been handled in terms of, if you don't consent to this, what will happen next? I just think when we're making the legal argument, there isn't another factor at play here, and that is the UN Convention. Because the UN Convention is very, very clear in saying that it is never the obligation of the child to somehow adjust and adapt to fit into the school. The onus is on the member state and its agencies, in this case in the school, to adapt to meet the needs of the child. So when an autistic child, for example, is struggling and maybe as a result of experiences a meltdown, uh, loses the ability to communicate, that's not a choice. That's something that's happening because of the environment and the experience they're having being inaccessible. And I think what's really, really important is we need to look at this from an accessibility point of view and realise that that onus has to keep going back on the state. And what I'm concerned about is when instances like that are happening at present, the policy that tends to be operated is a code of behaviour, not an accessibility policy around how can we support the child um, in this instance. To give you an example, we're frequently having families get in touch with us now where the use of a behaviour contract is being put to children as young as 9 and 10, and children are being asked to sign documents that say things like, I will respect personal space, I will be mindful of my tone of voice, um, I won't um, get agitated or distressed if, if something, a change of plan happens. It's the equivalent of asking a child to sign a document that says I won't be autistic anymore. These are fundamental accessibility needs and they're not being recognised. And I think what this comes down to is in the document that I've already submitted, uh, our, our, our written submission, we outline from the parents we talked to about reduced timetables the reasons they cited their children were on reduced timetables. And resources comes up particularly in the lack of autism classes, but also issues like lack of teacher training, the sensory environment, staff not having the training around communication. So there is deeper cultural issues here as well that I think have to be uh, recognised. I know some questions were asked, uh, I think by Deputy Martin, just around some of the numbers. So 
from our point of view, in our survey, 47% of the young people who were on reduced timetable had no engagement with their CENO. I have the numbers on TUSTA, and we also have the numbers for how long that the reduced timetable has been in place. I just don't have them with me, but we can send them on no problem. It's probably worth saying as well, we've found that reduced timetables tend to be the first step towards a suspension or an expulsion. And we did, during the research process for this, try an FOI, the department, around the number of suspensions and expulsions of children with disabilities. But there's no data on that presently either. And I think that's a piece that really fits hand in glove with this issue. Um, the final just couple of points was the question was asked about qualifications. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of instances where very newly qualified teachers are being placed in, for example, in autism classes or in additional teaching roles that I think are, it, it isn't appropriate. And I think the message that has to keep going out is it's not a case that you decide if you're an SEN teacher or a mainstream teacher. Now our system is simply that you're a teacher and you have to be willing to teach whoever you're called upon to do so, particularly as you become more experienced. What I am concerned about in terms of the space children are in when a lot of these incidents happen, what I'm seeing over time is actually a deterioration in the accessibility of school buildings for autistic students. So if you think about all these new buildings that are being built around the country and they're beautiful, they have an awful lot of light, so there's a huge amount of glare in the building. Multi-purpose space is being used, so there's a lot of sensory activity at once. Even the colour schemes throughout school buildings, the very bright, vibrant colours that are now being used in the buildings, are posing fundamental accessibility issues. So we're looking now at physical access, but we're still not embedding autism-friendly design into the construction of autism classes or, or autism schools. Um, the final point, Chair, was just in relation to the issue of training, because it's no, there's no doubt this is what it fundamentally comes back to again and again and again, that even though we're now in a situation where pe people with disabilities have been attending schools for quite some time, teachers are still completing their education as teachers without any discreet awareness of things like autism, for example. There's a very good piece of work done, being done in Mary Immaculate College in Thurless at the moment, where they've become the first initial teacher education college that has a compulsory module on autism. And I think this is something that needs to be looked at and explored more fully. In terms of CPD, I think the question needs to be asked around what is the uptake, for example, of schemes like the Middletown Centre for Autism's training programme? And where they are low, why is that the case? I understand from the teacher unions, they're very, very keen to be able Able to access more training. So I think a key priority in addressing this issue has to be to identify what sort of training is needed and how can it be delivered in a way that's acceptable for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. If I don't have supplementaries, I'm proposing that we go straight to section two. Yeah, well, I know I don't have to delay it. We have votes yeah. coming up soon. Yeah. Yeah. I do, oh, no, I don't, I'll delay it, but it's a fundamental issue. Maybe, some, maybe actually some of the officials could, could, could answer it. Just the issue of the suspension. Like the, 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 sorry, the, the, nobody's really addressed this. That, that if, in, in effect, sorry, this is an, a suspension, and the Section 29 procedures presumably then apply. But I invite the officials maybe to address that yeah. if they can, yeah. rather than delay you. it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll move on then. Uh, Dr. Muldoon, who's the Ombudsman for Children, I'm going to ask you to make your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'll, I'll try and. Uh, Cut it, cut it to this, cut the cloth to a quicker time. Um, delighted to have the invitation here. And as the committee is aware, the Ombudsman for Children's Office is an independent human rights institution established under the Ombudsman for Children Act 2002. And in light of my statutory obligation, I welcome the committee's decision to examine the use of reduced timetables and to shine a light on this issue. It's important to note from the outset that equal access to education is a fundamental right for children under UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as well as the, the Constitution, and Ireland ratified that in 1992. Two of the main articles provide that all children must be able to enjoy their rights without any discrimination of any kind, and that the child's best interest should be treated as a primary consideration in all actions concerning them. And I believe the current invisibility of the reduced timetables in Irish schools is a real and serious concern, impacting how we as a country can say with confidence that we are upholding all of our children's rights fairly and equally. I'm aware that schools sometimes use reduced timetables as a positive intervention in exceptional circumstances for the purpose of supporting children at a particularly difficult time in their lives when a full day at school may have become an insurmountable challenge. And in these circumstances, schools use reduced timetables to facilitate a child to continue with their education at the maximum extent possible until such time as they're able to return to school full time. And this can be understood as a child-centred practice that's underpinned by a commitment to acting in the best interest of the child concerned. And I think some of the examples that I already gave were, were very good in that regard. In our experience, the use of these, in these exceptional circumstances rarely causes difficulties and tends to involve a partnership between the child's parent or guardians and the school. 
However, even in these circumstances, it's essential to be cognizant of a potential inequality in the negotiating position of the parents and the school. Therefore, safeguards need to be put in place to ensure that the use of a reduced timetable for the purpose of supporting a child is time limited, is in the best interest of the child concerned, and is put in place without any pressure having been placed on the child's parent, guardian, to agree with it. Simple safeguards in these circumstances could be a clear, shared and agreed understanding between the school, the child and the parents. It should include a rationale for the time, reduced timetable, informed consent that is due regard to the views of the child and a formal written agreement between the school and the parents. If there are other parties involved in the, in the child, then they should have input to the specific details about how long the reduced timetable will be in place and dates for reviewing same. <coughs> I am more concerned about what I consider as the inappropriate use of reduced timetables as an informal suspension in response to behaviour by the child that a school is finding difficult to manage in classrooms. This type of response by schools oftentimes occurs in the absence of policy or guidance and it may not be recorded within the school and its use is not overseen by any external agency. This means that one child or a group of children could be missing significant amounts of education that cumulatively could be far more than a formal suspension and we have heard examples of that here today. As we all know, excluding a child's access to education is seen as an extremely serious sanction to the extent that there are specific safeguards under Irish policy and legislation regarding its use. And, uh, Deputy Byrne was considering was mentioning that. <clears throat> At the moment, the use of reduced timetables is invisible. It's not listed as an option. There's no guidelines on it, no guidance on recording it, and no external monitoring. Therefore, the oversight of its use is in individual schools. It's also impossible to determine if some cohort of children are more adversely affected than others. But as we've heard here today, children with disabilities, children with emotional behaviour difficulties, children from different cultural backgrounds, such as the traveller or Roma community, or those in disadvantaged areas, are likely to be the, the main uh, recipients of reduced timetables. It's important that we don't underestimate the impact of prolonged reduced timetables as an exclusionary measure as well. It may make children feel unwanted by the school community. They may be perceived as different by their peers. They may stop seeing school as a positive place, and they may even drop out of school. And it can be also very disruptive for family life. So again, we've got to, if, you're, if you're expecting your child to be in school for six or seven hours and you have to pick them up after one hour, it changes the whole family dynamics. So what do we believe is needed? In our view, the national policy and guidelines need to be developed, which set out clearly what a reduced timetable is, the exceptional circumstances in which it is permissible, the circumstances in which it is not permissible for school to use it, the information that schools must provide to guardians and parents and children about the time, reduced timetable, the procedure the schools must follow when seeking to place a child on it, including the process for engaging with the child and the child, ch child's parent and the children themselves, the procedures for recording and reporting any event to a higher uh, or another organisation, time limits should be uh, part of that, review times should be put in place very quickly. I mean, I think last, the last meeting last week, um, the Joint Management Board talked about um, a two-week limit. Procedures which for the schools must follow to facilitate uh, guardians and children to raise concerns and complain about the reduced timetable and there needs to be an appeals process. That's the, that's the standard fair justice. In this regard, we suggest that consideration should be given to providing appropriate statutory underpinning to the use of reduced timetables. And I also believe that further attention needs to be given to monitoring the uses of timetables nationally. And in this regard, the current absence of data, including the data to, to clarify the extent to which the practice is, is used in schools and the number of children being placed on it and which groups of children are more likely. So again, we're looking to see if there's a discrimination happening. We need to know the figures for that. So finally, I know I want to acknowledge the huge efforts have been made by teachers to balance the rights of all children within schools in that circumstances. And I've met with, with uh, primary school or the special needs principals who are putting huge efforts into this as well. And there has to be a case that schools are using reduced timetables as behaviour management intervention attention needs to be given to strengthening the supports available to schools through the Education and Welfare Service, NEPS, National Behaviour uh, Support Service, NCSE and all the other uh, auxiliary professionals that was mentioned by Orla, OT, SLT, CAMS, counselling. Um, I thank you for your time. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Niall. I now turn to Noel Kelly from TUSA, the Child and Family Agency. Uh, Chairperson, Deputies, Senators and fellow witnesses, on behalf of TUSLA, I thank you for this opportunity to address you today on the matter of reduced timetables. Uh, TUSLA's Education Welfare Service, which I represent, supports every child and young person's right to education, and we also support the right of every child to attend for the full school day, unless exempted for exceptional reasons. The key legislation related to school attendance, and Deputy Byrne re references a few minutes ago, is outlined in the Education Welfare Act 2000. 
and in order to assist schools to comply with their obligations under this legislation, uh, the National Education Welfare Board, which was the pre preceded the Tusla Education Welfare Service and Tusla, have produced two resource booklets to schools, and these are namely the Developing a Code of Behaviour, which was issued in 2008, and Developing a Statement of Strategy for School Attendance, which was issued to all schools in 2015. So hard copies of these have been issued to all schools and soft copies are available online. Under the Education Welfare Act 2000, schools are obliged to submit reports on school attendance to the Education Welfare Service if, and there are four key areas, a student has been suspended for six or more consecutive days. So that's if it's a running suspension that runs for six or more days. If a student has reached 20 days cumulative absence during the course of a school year. If a principal is concerned about a student's attendance, so that the principal can make that decision at any stage or if the Board of Management of a school intends to expel a student. Guidance has been provided to schools regarding reduced timetables and suspensions, and this refers to the question that Deputy Bourne just asked, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote from the, 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 both of these guidelines. It says that exclusion of a student for part of the school day as a sanction, or asking parents to keep a child from school as a sanction, is a suspension. Any exclusion imposed by a school is a suspension, and should follow the guidelines relating to suspensions. So that has been very clear in both of those guidelines since 2008. Under Section 29 of the Education Act 1998, parents have the right to appeal any suspension, and Tusla Education Welfare Service is available to advise and support parents should they wish to make such an appeal. Tusla Education Welfare Service is aware that reduced times are being reduced timetables are being used in some schools, but our awareness, like other witnesses, is informed by anecdotal information, information from representative groups, and also from parents who do contact us seeking support in relation to their child. There is a lack of hard data available to gauge the actual extent of the use of reduced timetables, as in many cases, as has been said previously, it appears to be unrecorded and unreported. We recognise, as some other witnesses have said, that schools do face complex needs on a daily basis. And we are aware that in certain exceptional circumstances, the use of a reduced timetable may be beneficial for a student. However, we believe that any such arrangements should be short-term in nature, have regular scheduled reviews, be in the best interests of the student, have an accompanying education plan, have an accompanying plan for full integration, and be agreed by the, the school, the parents, guardians, and the student. Tusla Education Welfare Service is working currently with partners in education and our own parent department to address the issue of reduced timetables, and we have prepared a proposed response, which we can share with you later. So thank you, uh, Chair and Deputy Senators, for the opportunity to make this brief opening statement. Thank you very much, Noel. And I now move to the Department of Education. And we have Mary Craig, who's the Principal Officer in Social Inclusion, and Eddie Ward, uh, Principal Officer in Special Education. I'm not sure which one of you is going to. You're going to take it, Mary. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to address the committee on this important issue. I want to open by stating very clearly that the Department's position is that each and every child has a right to education to enable them to live a full life and to realise his or her potential. The Education Act sets out the function of the Minister to provide for education. The Act places a responsibility on boards of management to manage schools for the benefit of all students and provide an appropriate education utilising the resources made available by the State. The position of the Department of Education and Skills is that all pupils who are enrolled in a school should attend for the, school, the full school day unless exempted in exceptional circumstances. Reduced timetables should not be used as a behaviour management technique or as a de facto suspension or expulsion, nor does provision exist for the use of reduced timetables for particular cohorts of pupils. Where schools apply a shorter day in relation to a child, such arrangements should only be put in place in exceptional circumstances in order, for example, to assist a pupil to return to school where they have been experiencing an absence due to a medical or a mental health related condition. Any such arrangement should be a transitionary arrangement which is designed to assist the reintegration of a pupil to a school environment. In making such arrangements, school authorities should be mindful of the best interests of the child and of the child's right to a full school day. 
Early intervention and whole school approaches are the most important strategy in managing emotional and behavioural difficulties. The department has put in place a suite of resources, including special education teachers and special needs assistants, to support the inclusion of pupils with special educational needs or behavioural issues. The National Council for Special Education provided, and the National Educational Psychological Service provide training and guidance to schools around the inclusion of pupils with special educational needs, including around the management of behaviours that challenge. The Department recognises that this is a complex issue and the Department is investing heavily in supporting children with special educational needs with 1.9 billion being spent in 2019. Since 2011 the number of special education teachers has increased by 37% to over 13,400. Provision for up to 15,950 special needs assistance in total has been made for 2019, an increase of 51% since 2011. This department also provides a number of resources to DASH schools and funds the DASH programme to the tune of 125 million. The DASH programme supports attendance and retention, um, including the Homeschool Community Liaison Scheme, which is part of TUSLA's Integrated Educational Welfare Service, comprising the School Completion Programme and the Statutory Educational Welfare Service. The Department of Education and Skills is aware that the traveller representative groups have highlighted inappropriate usage of reduced timetables in the context of poor educational outcomes. This department is committed to working with traveller and Roma to achieve educational outcomes that are equal to those of the rest of the population and a number of initiatives are in place to try to address the current gap. I would like to assure the committee and those present that the Department of Education and Skills is working with TUSLA Educational Welfare Service and DCY to support schools with a view to ensuring that the use of reduced timetables is limited only to exceptional circumstances where it is necessary. Um, to, that, uh, to that end, we are looking at an assessment of the data which is available and working towards producing joint guidelines which will clarify the sorts of situations as referred to by um, the principal here in terms of the situations which may be appropriate. And that process will involve consultation with, with stakeholders. So I want to assure the committee that we are addressing this issue in conjunction with our colleagues in, in TUSLA. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to go back to the members now. Deputy Martin had indicated first. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go straight to the department, um, if that's okay. Um, the position, it, it says there, of the Department of Education and Skills um, is that reduced timetables time should not be used as behavioural management technique or as a de facto suspension or expulsion. Um, so, how have, have you checked that? Like, are you actually <laughs> telling me that the department believes that schools are only using reduced timetables in the cases of exceptional circumstances? Um, and that you are aware of um, that the traveller representative groups have highlighted inappropriate uses of reduced timetables? Is that the only awareness you have of the inappropriate use of uh, the reduced timetable usage? Um, quite shocking that they would even have to bring that to you, but there are many others who are, who are suffering due to the reduced timetable, um, um, abuse of the reduced timetable. So, um, so when did the department last communicate with schools clarifying that position, as you've outlined, the only in exceptional circumstances? How have you been checking that it's only used in exceptional circumstances? And if it's, if it's not to be used as a de facto suspension. Um, Noel has outlined there that guidance has been provided to schools that the exclusion of a student for part of the school day as a sanction or asking parents to keep a child from school as a sanction is a suspension. So you're saying it can't be used as a de facto suspension but guidance has been provided to schools that that is in fact a suspension, the re reduced timetable. I just could you just explain that to me how that's happening. Um, either it is or it isn't. And if it is, how many Section 29s um, have happened? How many parents have appealed this? Because my fear is that parents are not being informed, the parents of the, the most vulnerable, the parents of the students in the disadvantaged areas who are, are being subjected to, to the reduced timetable aren't aware of their rights, aren't aware how to challenge it. So what are we doing for, for, for the parents to make sure that they can advocate properly for the right for their, their, their child to, to education? What supports are there to make sure that child is getting that uh, right to education? Um, 
do you know what happens when a parent disagrees? I, I don't want that. And when a parent is told, well, then your child's out. What, happen, what, what happens there? Um, what's the, like, are children put in reduced timetables against parents' wishes? Um, why is uh, the operation, I believe it's not, I asked this question two weeks ago, why is the operation of reduced timetables in schools not included in whole school evaluations, MLL, DASH inspections? Like, how easy is, is it to add that question um, when you come in for three or four days for a week into a school? Are you operating the reduced timetables? Give me all the facts on it. How do they go on it? Um, surveying the students, as happens in the MLL, surveying the parents, adding that question. To, to those surveys, when you uh, when you um, meet with the board of management in Nemadal, are they are they being asked how many um, how many reduced timetables have you approved and why? And did you feel you know all members of the board of management are okay? Did they feel they're just going with the principal? How well informed are you on this? Um, what what is the, the the plan now? Like I know the minister said he's not happy with this, but that's you know <laughs> needs more than that. When you say at the very end there, um, you'd like to assure us that the department is working with TUSLA and to, to, to with a view to ensuring that the use of timetables is limited to only those exceptions there for nursery. What does that mean? Can you break that down for me? What does that mean? And what are we going to see? What, what is the plan? How are you going to address it? How are you going to stop this? And how are you going to support principles like ORDA? Uh, where there's nearly a, there's a health and safety danger there. Some of the, the cases that Orla outlined there, like the, there's danger that, with the, 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 the behaviour that, that Orla is trying to manage in a school. That's unfair on the students, it's unfair on principals, it's unfair into, and it's not safe. So what are you putting in place? What is the plan, the, the greater plan? Um, you know, there's violent and aggressive outbursts. There has to be a better option to reduce timetables. There has to be. And I, I just don't understand how the department has been blind and deaf to all this. Like, it came to us to shine this light, and it's the best thing that's happened is that the light is being shone on this. But did it really take to June 2019 to shine a light on this, this use and misuse of, of reduced timetables and on the, 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 the dire need to resource our teachers and our principals and our schools to provide the education that every child has a right to. Um, I think that's it. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Deputy Martin. Deputy Byrne. Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Deputy Martin there. I think what this committee has uncovered is an illegality uh, that is ongoing. I think we need to hold further public hearings. Uh, I would be suggesting that the Chief Inspector uh, come in, Mr Hislop, because I think the recommendation that there is good. I also think we need to bring back uh, Mary Byrne and her colleagues as well, because not only have the Department have been deaf to this, but they have been warned and specifically stated by Ms Byrne today, in 2012 and 2016 the Department have been warned about this. Uh, and have clearly done nothing except obviously issue the legal position, which is this is, this is not acceptable. They've stated that clearly on the record at every occasion. And in fairness to uh, Ms Craig, who's I think relatively new in this particular role, she, she is the most hard line on this particular issue, that it just simply shouldn't be happening at all. Uh, but in practice, that's not what happening, what, what's happening in school. Um, that's, it's not happening. Children are being denied their legal and constitutional rights on a daily basis. And by the way, if anyone's watching out there, and I'm sure there are, the advice I give to people is to ask for this in writing uh, from principals. And oftentimes, uh, according to colleagues around the country, when you ask for the, the, the an announcement in writing of your reduced hours, uh, it simply doesn't happen. Uh, it's not acceptable that parents are getting phone calls. So I think we need to keep on this because there's, there's two sides. So one is the, that, the, the, that this shouldn't happen, but also, secondly, that to, to allow it not to happen, we need, we need the resources put in place. I have to think, I think that, and I have very great respect for the Children's Ombudsman, but I don't think he's hit the nail on the head on this particular issue. I think, I think this, is, this is an illegality and it just has to stop. And I think that a, a harder line from the Ombudsman uh, would be helpful. I think you have been, you've been clear, but you actually haven't been as clear as the Department and as uh, the, N, the National Council for Special Education have been on this. Uh, and I think that, you know, I'm not, it's, uh, you're an independent officer, so it's not my job to tell you your role. But if the Department is saying this shouldn't happen basically at all except for this illness uh, and we know that it's happening from, from the uh, groups and I think, I think that I would certainly encourage the Ombudsman to take a fresh look at this and I, I think the committee 
definitely needs to hold further public hearings on this to get to the bottom of it. And I have to say, the resources issue is obviously the big elephant in the room, but, there, but, but the Constitution guarantees uh, there, it's the only right that encompasses resources in the Constitution is the right to primary education, and second level education follows on for that. So the right to primary education uh, employs resources. Nothing else in the Constitution. There's no right to health care in the Constitution. There's a right to education. Uh, and I think I accept the point that you made about the, the, the cuts uh, in relation to travellers, and obviously, we, and we hear that at this committee, it's not aired all the time, but we do hear obviously about the resources for children with special needs all the time, and from uh, the, the, desk, the desk school system as well. So this, this, in my opinion, is an illegality, and I think that we should maybe, maybe we should maybe ask the Oireachtas uh, uh, Law Service uh, to, to look at this from a legal point of view as well uh, and get in the Chief Inspector, get in the Minister, get back in the NCSE, I think, maybe to go through in more detail uh, the advice that they gave. That could be provided to us. I think it would be very useful. Uh, but they say that Mary has, um, Ms. Byrne has said that she's given it in 2012 and 2016, uh, and I certainly would, would be very interested in hearing more okay. about that. Thank you, Deputy Byrne. Senator Gallagher. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, at the outset, I would like to apologise. I had a pop out earlier there for another meeting, and I apologise to the witnesses for that. Um, uh, this is the, the second day that we've um, had presentations from witness in relation to this area, and I come away with the conclusion that um, the system, uh, as we have it, is failing the children concerned, uh, is failing the, the parents of those children concerned, uh, and is failing the schools and it's failing the teachers. And I can see that, uh, in many ways, the finger is being pointed towards the schools, and uh, I think that's unfair. Uh, I think the schools don't have the necessary resources in order to, to address this issue. And I think uh, Orla made a presentation earlier, uh, and she drew a picture for me as to what the problem is. Um, and as Bernard said, we know what the problem is now, and now we have to we have to try and find a solution to it, and that is not simple. What alarms me, and, and the previous two speakers alluded to it as well, is the fact that this has gone on for so long, uh, and it's only now that we're having a conversation about it. That's quite alarming, actually. And I appreciate that uh, Mary outlined the department's case, um, and but it's not convincing based on the evidence we've, we've received from the witnesses. It's all very well to talk about the right of a child to education is a different matter entirely to ensure the child gets that education. And that clearly is not happening in this regard. Um, a lot of my sympathy, as I said, goes goes to the children and the parents, but indeed a lot goes to the schools as well. It's clearly the schools are at the end of their tether, uh, trying to not just look after this area, but indeed many other areas within the school. And clearly resources are a serious problem. And that is the elephant in the room. Uh, and if we're serious about tackling this issue, then, number one, I think the department needs to give leadership. At the very least, we need guidelines as to how you reduce timetables, when they're going to be used, how they're going to be used, how long they're going to be used for, and in what instance are they going to be used. And it's quite alarming and shocking that, as Catherine Martin says, June 2019, we don't seem to have that. And. Um, it's a very, I appreciate that this is a very, very complex area, and the department itself does not have, it was in their gift to be able to have all the solutions to this. It's a cross-departmental issue. And yes, these sessions have been useful in that they've shined light on the problem that exists. Now we need to move on now to trying to find a solution to that. And the Department of Education, in my mind, needs to give clear guidelines and needs to attack, at, at, to show more urgency in trying to find guidelines and solutions to this issue than it has heretofore. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Deputy O'Sullivan. Uh, thanks. Uh, I mean, there's clearly a breakdown here between what's supposed to happen and what actually happens, uh, and I think that's what we need to. We need to. We have shone a light on it, as we've said, but we now need to be very specific about what needs to happen. So I, I just want to ask my first question of Noel from Tusla. You said that there's an obligation to report to the Education Welfare Board and that partial exclusions are suspensions. So, uh, and on the other hand, um, Caroline told us earlier on that in her survey, only 27% 
of the cases the Education Welfare Officer, as, as, as far as they know from the information they have, that the Education Welfare Officer was only aware of 27% of the cases. So that's clearly a breach of what's supposed to happen. Um, so maybe your response on that, Noel, in terms of how do you tell the school, you know, are the schools told that they're supposed to report to the Education Welfare Board on suspensions? Um, so I, I think that's obviously a breakdown there. Uh, and in relation to the department then, can I ask the question that Adam raised earlier on about, and I think the answer is no, but in relation to data, um, have you a breakdown on data uh, in relation to um, either suspensions or indeed or um, reduced timetables in relation to uh, children who go to Dutch schools, for example, children who are uh, from traveller families or Roma families and children who have special educational needs. Is there any breakdown of data in relation? I think from what you've said, Adam, there probably isn't, but I'd just like to get a clear answer on that. Um, last time we heard from um, the National Association of Principals and Deputy Principals, the Irish Primary Principals Network, the National Association of Board of Managements of Special Education and the Joint Managerial Body. Uh, and they all basically said the same policy statement that everyone here has said, that it should be only in exceptional circumstances, it should only be as a last resort, etc., etc. And yet, that doesn't seem to be the reality. So again, you know, we're hearing sort of policy that it's only in, in very special cases, but yet in practice that it obviously is in much, much more commonly used. So, um, so again, that, that's, that's a breakdown in information. So can I ask something that came up last week uh, of the Department of Education? Um, can you put an extra field into the requirements of the pod so that the, the returns that schools give, uh, can you put a field in that it obliges the schools to say, um, what uh, reduced times tables they have, um, and I'm not sure if suspensions is in already, I think it probably is, but, um, you know, so that at least they would have to return the information. Um, and, and I suppose then the last question is around um, the guidelines. Um, you mentioned, Mary, that there are guidelines being drafted. When do you expect those guidelines to be, um, to be ready and to be communicated to schools? And I suppose to ask of, of um, all, all of you in, the, in this second group, um, in terms of what has been discussed here and at the previous hearings, um, will you, I suppose, seriously look now at the, the whole reporting mechanisms, the whole um, rights of parents and rights of children, more importantly, rights of children in this regard, um, and um, we will obviously be making a report as a committee, but will you also go back to, I suppose, your own obligations to ensure uh, that we address this, what is obviously a problem that in theory shouldn't be um, anything like the problem that it is, but in practice, from what we have heard, appears to be a much more common practice than, um, than, than is meant to actually be the case. Okay, thank you, Deputy. Just one or two points that I would make myself. And Noel, thank you for the clarification that a reduced timetable should be considered suspension and should be recorded as such, because I think that's the first time we've received that clarification. I'm quite shocked, and I suppose and just following on from Deputy O'Sullivan's question about data, to me it's quite clear that the Department haven't been collecting data in relation to reduced timetables, and I'm just wondering why. Um, that that is that has happened that there is no collection of that data and also just something that we came across at our meeting two weeks ago about the lack of availability of home tuition for children on a reduced timetable and um, the children were absolutely missing out and why there couldn't be some type of availability of home tuition in that case i know that several submissions that we received both today and a fortnight ago cite the need for a multidisciplinary and cross-professional approach in relation to the care of, of children at risk in terms of um, those that are on reduced timetables and looking, looking at that. So I'm just interested in any comments on that. Um, I know that Mary said in her submission that um, recommendations were made to the department and again Deputy Byrne raised that, just wondering why those recommendations haven't been put in place. I think it's very helpful and useful to know that 
the NCSE are doing a pilot project in relation to this, but also I'm conscious that is only for children with special needs, that there are other groups that are isolated and excluded also. So we need to see if in some way some type of pilot scheme can be put in place to address those other children that are excluded as well. So I'll go back now uh, to the panel and we might go to the department first. So will it be Eddie or Mary who will take those? I'll, I'll take this one, Chair. Um, if he wants to add, that's fine sure. as well. Um, I suppose it, from the department's point of view, I want to reinforce it is a complex issue. It is something that we will need to look at in terms of uh, across the board. Um, the exceptional circumstances do apply and, and we've heard and we're aware of that and the, the issue really is that in terms of reduced timetable it, it should only be a last resort at the end of a process um, which involves consultation with the parents but that it is exceptional circumstances where it should apply. Um, it is uh, in the context of the inspectorate's inspection of schools in terms of what the inspector does, which is um, to um, look at uh, supporting the, the school improvement um, piece and uh, doing a quality assessment of the teaching and learning within the school and a quality assessment of the learning experience and outcomes. That's the context in which the school inspection process uh, operates. So one of the questions obviously that comes up in the context of that in DESH inspections, uh, schools are asked uh, how many times reduced timetables are used within the school that's a relatively recent development but I can um, assure you that where it does come up and it, it comes up within schools that inspectors are in a position to actually challenge well is this the best is, is this the best uh, is this the best process or has everything else been followed before this would put in place and um, from those school inspections um, it, it would appear that the process has been followed where it has been raised but that's in a school context as opposed to in an individual context. Process. There's, there's sorry, no, the chair. Yeah, sorry Chairman. In terms of whether resources have been applied appropriately, whether the supports available from the department have been put in place. NEPs for example are available to support schools um, where necessary and obviously NEPs would, would uh, would propose that early intervention and whole school approaches are the best way of, of tackling issues. Um, in terms of emotional and behavioural difficulties, um, NEPS would support uh, building teachers' capacities to be able to manage pupils' behaviour within the classroom. And then about 80% of, of NEPS work is around um, individual casework with students, so they are available to support schools. Um, there would obviously be um, other uh, processes that would need to be followed in the context of the school's own statement of uh, strategy on school attendance, and TUSLA have issued guidelines on what should go into a school's attendance strategy. Um, and in that context, it's important that when a school is, is looking at a child's attendance that the, the statement of strategy is taken into account. So, um, sorry, 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 I will allow you in a supplementary, okay. just allow Mary to uh, respond and then I will allow both of you have indicated. Okay, just uh, to go back to some of the other, um, the other issues, obviously TUSLA, TUSLA Educational Welfare Service has a role in supporting school attendance um, and as Noel has referred to the Educational Welfare Offices are available to, um, to support parents. In relation to this data on the section 29, perhaps we can follow up with that to the committee. Um, and the extra field in pod, I think it's, it's important to look at where the school attendance data um, is returned to TUSLA. Um, what's really required here in, in terms of the, the guidelines, and we'll be working closely with, with TUSLA on this, I mean, firstly, what we need to do is to look at the evidence that is there, um, whether that's via the Section 29 appeals, the school returns mechanisms, or the um, inspector's evaluations. And secondly, then, in terms of the guidelines the, uh, that would be put in place following that, uh, it would include the, the sort of things that have been referred to here in terms of it being time limited based on international best practice and a review process being put in place. I suppose the real thing in this is the, the notification to two slender um, so that they're in a, in a, they're in a position to um, monitor where reduced timetables are being put in place and that too will form part of the, the guidelines that we will issue as well. Thank you Mary. Uh, did you want to um, well, just in relation to the special needs aspect, uh, and I recognise that the reduced timetable issue is, 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 is a bigger issue than that. Um, 
The Department's approach in recent times is very much driven by evidence-based policy, as comes from the NCSE, and you heard some of that from, the, from, from Mary uh, uh, this morning. And I suppose our, our approach, uh, the Department's approach, um, in the, well, say since 2012, has been very much about putting the resources and, um, in place. And, you know, we're talking about uh, additional teachers, we're talking about SNAs, we're talking about a whole variety of sports, and the level of, of special classes and the numbers of people on the ground has increased substantially, where almost 20% of the total education vote is now being used on special education. That is the thrust of the way we intend to go. Um, we, the the, the uh, therapeutic supports in schools was referenced, and that is a, a pilot that's underway at the moment, uh, which will be evaluated. And the, the intention is that if the evaluation is, is positive, uh, it will be to plan for its more extensive rollout into the school system so that all schools would have access to in-school therapeutic support around um, occupational therapy, speech and language and behavioural support. Um, we recognise that there, there are gaps and that we will continue to address that through the evidence-based, uh, evidence-informed um, policy making and that we will evaluate as, as, as we go through. Um, I think the debate and the discussion is, is, is very, uh, very uh, informative and I think it's very helpful from our point of view. Um, it's good that we know what is happening on the ground. The inspector does give us feedback and their focus is about you know, teaching and learning in the school and how department resources are, are, are used. But I think when we hear the, use of the feedback from stakeholders, people at the cold face and the school principal earlier, I think that's very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And when you talk about evidence-based, um, and I understand there's a lot of evidence here, but based on the fact that data hasn't been collected, I would feel that there is not enough evidence yes. in order yes. to yes. actually go That's forward. I did say I'd allow quick, very quick supplementaries in. Deputy Byrne. Yeah, I'm conscious that there's only about five minutes before the vote, yeah. I'd say, so we, wanna, we don't want to keep people for... Oh, no, I'm going to go back yeah, I just, I just, I don't, I don't need an answer to this because okay. I think we need to follow this up ourselves. But uh, I challenge Ms. Craig on saying that uh, there's a process. There's no process. I mean, the minister is very clear that this is not acceptable, except for medical reasons. Basically, exceptional circumstances, medical reasons were given as the example. The only process is a suspension process. I think that's been clarified. And relating to evidence-based approach, I echo what you say. Um, first of all. Ms Byrne has told us today that there's no evidence that this is beneficial, that they haven't found it, they haven't done the research, they don't have evidence on this. And secondly, they have warned uh, that this may be a problem twice, and there's been no answer from the Department. Um, Deputy Martin, you indicated. You want um, to say yeah, just in relation to the answer referring to the process, I, I too would have question marks over there and where the parent and the child um, fits into that um, and how best uh, the advice they're seeing on it. Um, in, I did ask when did the department last write to schools outlining the department's position and if the department's position is uh, not to be used as a behavioural management technique, it is being used as a behavioural management technique. So again, my other question, as I asked earlier, what supports are you given to schools to, to help manage violent and aggressive students? And in, um, Eddie, you mentioned there listening to the, the stakeholders today has been very helpful. I think one thing we should take out of today is that there is a child in Ireland who is two years on a reduced timetable. So some inspection or other has, has missed that, the department has missed that. One child is one child too many. Uh, and it's absolutely disgraceful that a child has been placed on a reduced timetable for two years. It needs to stop. You have to stop this. Just on a point of clarification, um, Mary, I think you mentioned that um, the principals would report to TUSLA in relation to um, the issues that we discussed but the department were seemed to be taken out of the link on that. Could you just clarify that? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Okay, John. When yeah. you think the guidelines will be ready. Yeah. Um, well, TUSLA have the statutory role in relation to attendance, and perhaps I'll defer to Noel on, in, in terms of an elaboration on that. But obviously the education welfare officers are in the field and where reduced timetable is put in place. If you look at what happens in, in other jurisdictions, um, you know, the attendance officers would be involved and informed when a, a, a reduced timetable is, is put in place. So that's something that we're looking at. And we work very closely with Tuesday Educational Welfare Services in, in relation to that. When I'm talking about process, just to clarify in terms of, um, you know, what process involved, obviously this involves the, ha, have the resources deployed to the school been used appropriately? So for example, in a DESH school, the home school community liaison officer, um, has the school completion program been involved? Has every 
every effort being made to ensure that the child can be stay on in the school before a reduced timetable would be would be put in place. That's where I'm coming from in relation to that. Um, so just in terms of the, the, the timeline, um, Deputy O'Sullivan referenced when would the guidelines be ready and obviously there's a process of consultation that will need to take um, place in terms of, of stakeholders but we would be looking at, at, at um, actioning this with their colleagues in Tusla as, as soon as possible with a view to addressing it as soon as we can. Thank you, Eddie. If you have any comments before I go back to, to Noel? No, no. No, okay. No. Okay, but thanks, Chair. I, I'm just going to respond to a number of issues that came from, from the, the deputies and senators, but also a couple of comments that maybe came from the, the other presenters as well. First of all, schools are aware that they have a, an obligation to report in relation to suspensions. It's, it's very clear in the legislation. It's also very clear in the guidelines. And as recently as 2015, they were issued to all schools because they were, all schools were requested to, to develop and submit a statement of, of strategy around it. Attendance. Now, as of today, 86% of schools have actually submitted that, despite uh, my department having two staff working full-time reminding people. So we still have, so I just want to say to Senator Gallagher, while absolutely we don't want to point the finger at schools, the vast majority of schools really do try their absolute best to comply, but there are a small percentage that don't. Um, the, the reporting of suspensions happens at the end of the school year. So if we are to do anything about intervening, that's not going to work. So what we're proposing to do, in, in following up on Mary's point, is that at the moment, if schools intend to ex expel a student, they have to submit an intention to expel to TUSLA before they can actually do it. So it has to come into us, it has to be logged in our office, and then our education welfare officers are able to intervene. And we have quite a high success rate. Last year, out of 300 plus uh, intentions to, to expel, it resulted in about 180 expulsions, so we managed to stop about 120 of them by working with the school and with the family. We're proposing something similar in relation to reduced timetables. Even though I've clearly said that a reduced timetable is a suspension, we're going to be developing a reporting form that schools will have to submit to us if they intend to put a student on a reduced timetable. Now, whether that's going to flush all of this out or not is another question, because I think it's quite clear from listening to all the evidence, both the last day and today, is that a lot of this is happening underground. It's not being recorded, it's not being reported, it's not being written down. But I think we will also take seriously our responsibility to inform all schools and also to inform all parents. So I will be proposing before, certainly in the first term next year, that we will get an information leaflet out to all parents on information in relation to it. And also we're redeveloping our website and we will have a frequently asked questions there where parents can actually log on and see what are my rights. And I'm also aware I've just finished doing a piece of work with the Children's Rights Alliance. They're updating their, their information sheets for parents and students. So again, that will be available. So there will be multiple sources of information for parents. Um, in relation to, um, Reporting mechanisms, yeah, that's what I've suggested, that we're going to put an actual referral form in place rather than the end of your report, so the schools will be obliged, they will have access to that and they submit that form to us. Not, not really, but what we're saying really is that it is a suspension, but we're saying we want to find out if this is happening. I'm hoping, Deputy Byrne, that once we've raised the awareness on this, that the practice will, will cease or will only continue, as we've all suggested, in the cases where it's absolutely appropriate to support a child. And again, we will be asking for information as to has this been sanctioned, what's the plan. In relation to collecting data um, and availability of home tuition, I, I think there, there's more information maybe that needs to be shared around that because the reality is we can't, the, the department, and I fully support the department, they cannot issue home tuition if somebody goes on a reduced timetable because the school is, is the provider of education for those ch children. They're technically in school. Um, also in relation to suspensions, and this was asked earlier, just to give you a sense of the data, at the, the, the records that we have over the last 10 school years, about 0.3% of primary school pupils are suspended every year, about 3.8% of post-primary students are suspended, and people asked in relation to students with special education needs, we also collect data on the special schools and the level of suspension and expulsion in the special schools is vastly higher. Yeah. The population of the special schools makes up 1.4% of the student population. 28% yeah. of primary school expulsions happen in the special school and 22% of primary yeah. school suspensions. So certainly children with special needs, there, there is evidence there to say that this is, is, is more common. So again, I think that the supports piece that we talked about needs to be looked at there. I hope I've addressed all the questions yeah. I was asked. Well, and I and in relation to, to guidance, no, I just, just, I want the gong has gone for Sorry. voting. <laughs> so, and I do want to give a, a last word to Niall. Thank you. I realise we're very late, so I just wanted to reiterate uh, in relation to Deputy Byrne's comment, 
Do really, we, I very clearly said that it should be a last resort and in exceptional circumstances that this should happen. I do think, to echo what Adam said, is there has been a, a history of don't ask, don't answer. So we haven't collected the information that way. We've got to remember that the school inspector are asking questions of, uh, in their inspector, does, does it happen in special schools, does it happen in STESH schools? That automatically thinks, shows to me discrimination. Why aren't we asking in every single school we go into? Because I do know anecdotally there's, there's principals who use it in order to force children out of school. Because, and again, there's the psychological impact of that. So it's across all the schools and maybe not as, as widespread. Resources and training is, is phenomenally important. Special school principals, we've got to recognise they also have children from four years of age to 18 years of age. And that's something, and even though they're, they're classed as primary schools, they will be dealing with children of all those age groups. And we have to give them that extra special uh, resources that they need in that circumstances. And then from our own point of view, we have got minimal complaints on this issue because it's never been, come, it's never been a formally an opportunity to complain by the parents. And that's something that has to come in with this new system. Thank you. Thank you, Niall. I'm going to wrap up now because uh, we're on our way to vote. But can I thank all of the witnesses and stakeholders? I think it's been a very informative morning uh, for us and indeed the two sessions that we had last week. And as far as I'm aware, we're the first education committee who has actually decided to look at this. I think it's really important that we've agreed to shine a light on this. And what I would be suggesting, there has been some suggestions from the other members, which we will look at in private, but we might possibly look at issuing an interim report and then coming back to it in the autumn and then bringing in further stakeholders in terms of how we go. But it's obviously there are, it's obvious that there are a lot of issues and we need to work together to try to address them and help support the children that, that we have in our school systems. So again, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm go now going to number, item number seven. As there is no other business, this meeting of the Joint Committee is adjourned on 3.30 on Tuesday the 18th of June 2019. Thank you. And excuse us while we run. Yeah.